it has the largest nose in the world. Its owner also possesses the biggest brain in the world. What it uses that huge brain for is still something of a mystery. As the dinosaurs proved, you don't need a large brain just to control a much larger body. The sperm whale may possibly be the most intelligent creature on Earth. During the past 150 years, almost all our knowledge of the sperm whale has been gathered by the very people who have done most to exterminate it, the whaling industry. Much of this whaling folklore is accurate. Not surprisingly, it's been gleaned from dead sperm whales or whales seen on the surface. A sperm whale spout distinguishes it from all other whales. The spray shoots up at least five meters and can be seen from three to five kilometers away. The single nostril, or blowhole, is situated to the left of center and well forward in what looks like a bump on the whale's nose. Sperm whales spend a good deal of their time at the surface, cruising together in pods of 20 or 30 animals. Though they're capable of moving much faster, their surface speed is usually around three to four knots, which has always made them an easy target for whalers' harpoons. Little is known about the sperm whale's life below the surface. They dive almost vertically and have been known to reach depths of over 3,000 meters. But how they find food so deep or manage to withstand the enormous water pressures is still a mystery. They are driven downward by the largest tail fluke of any of the great whales. There's no doubt about their prey. Whalers found that their stomachs were filled with squid, great and small. Sucker marks on harpoon sperm whales have shown that they sometimes grapple in those dark depths with squid whose tentacles must have been at least five meters long. The sperm whale has remained unchanged for 30 million years. Along with the beaked whales, it's the only large creature to have exploited the benthos, the uttermost depths of the ocean. It is so much a deep water species that it seems to have lost some of its adaptations for living in shallower water. That huge head contains a reservoir of fine oil that turns to wax on cooling. When diving, the whale can vary the density of this wax by flooding its nasal tubes with water of different temperatures from different depths and thus adjust the buoyancy of his body. The first sperm whale on record was harpooned off the United States Atlantic coast in 1712. Contemporary artists got the general shape right, but mistakenly gave the whale two blowholes. By the 1900s, Atlantic sperm whales were almost wiped out. They provided four million gallons of oil, but not without cost. Whale boats and crews were often smashed to pieces by the sperm whale's tail flukes and toothed jaws. There are two kinds of whale, baleen whales and toothed whales, but it's virtually impossible to appreciate details of their anatomy in the water. Baleen whales feed on plankton. This species is known as a right whale. In its mouth are a series of baleen plates for filtering krill. The whalers call it a right whale because it was the right whale to harpoon, as it tended to float after death. Another baleen whale is the humpback, sometimes called the singing whale because of its complex vocalizations. Humpbacks grow up to 16 meters and weigh about 30 tons. The small cetacean is a porpoise to give scale to the main subject's size. 
there's no doubt to which group the bowhead or Greenland right whale belongs. The long baleen plates with which it filters its food can be seen inside its upturned mouth. Bowheads were nearly exterminated by hunters who killed them largely for the value of this so-called whale bone. The average weight of a bowhead is between 60 and 100 tons. The toothed whales include all dolphins and the porpoise hovering over the dorsal fin of this Sowerby's beaked whale. There are 20 species of beaked whales and they've all got long narrow snouts and teeth in the lower jaw of which only one large one shows. Their average length is 5 metres and they can grow as heavy as 1400 kilograms. Among the toothed whales there's a separate family with two rather odd members. The first is the white whale or beluga. The head is rounded with a suggestion of a beak. White whales can reach 6 metres in length and are found mainly in shallow arctic waters. The second oddity is the narwhal. Adults have only one pair of teeth which grow horizontally in the upper jaw. The male's left tooth develops into a straight unicorn-like tusk. It probably plays a similar role to a stag's antlers in sexual and social behaviour. The largest toothed whale of them all is the huge sperm whale. Its scientific name is Physeter macrocephalus, which roughly translates as the wind instrument with a big head. The head is almost one third the length of the body. Inside is an instrument, as yet little understood, which produces the most amazing series of monotonous and repetitive clicks. The death knell of the sperm whale came at the turn of the century with the arrival of fast steamboats and modern harpoon guns. The Atlantic harvest was over. The slaughter spread further afield to the other oceans of the world. when 30,000 sperm whales were killed. Recently, some controls and the lack of sperm whales to hunt have given the species some respite. There is one place, however, where the sperm whales escaped this period of slaughter. The Galapagos Islands, just under 1,000 kilometres west of Ecuador. The area where the whales concentrate is quite a small one. It lies around the west side of the largest island, Isabella, and off its neighbour, Fernandina, north to a small lonely islet called Rocca Redonda. Beneath the sea around the islet runs a cold east flowing stream called the Cromwell Current, which brings nutrients to the surface and produces food to support a wealth of marine life. This feast attracts many species of predators, including sperm whales. The waters around the islands of Fernandina and Isabella are some of the richest in the tropical oceans. A few kilometres off Rocca Redonda, the fish shoals attract a great leaping school of spinner dolphins. that suit the smaller toothed whales, for example the spinner dolphins, also suit the largest toothed cetaceans of all, the sperm whales. 
no one in recent times appreciated the sperm whales were present here in such numbers until they were spotted from the air. Heading steadily for Rocca Redonda are two groups of 20 or more sperm whales. The fact that the whales today frequent this area in such numbers is due to one fortunate oversight. During the great whale slaughter after World War II, the modern whaling fleets overlooked Galapagos waters. However, the old time whalers knew all about what they called the Galapagos grounds. In 1793, Captain James Colnett of the British ship Rattler sailed round the Horn and found sperm whales there in great numbers. He recommended this site to British whalers. The British took his advice, and the American New England whalers weren't slow to follow. The whales were mercilessly exploited. After 1850, the whaling captains reported the Galapagos were dry cruising, meaning that whale stocks were so depleted that the dangerous voyage round the Horn was no longer worthwhile. Isabella and Rocca Redonda were left in peace. Gradually, the whales once more discovered this sanctuary. It was 135 years later that someone discovered them again. In 1985, a new kind of whaling vessel appeared on the Galapagos grounds, the 11-metre sloop Ellendil. Her skipper, Dr Hal Whitehead, had sailed the Ellendil across the Atlantic and through the Panama Canal to the Galapagos. Aboard her were four fellow scientists. Dr Whitehead, a world expert on sperm whales, had taken his team to the Galapagos drawn by the accounts of old whaling skippers. Scientists had been doubtful whether sperm whales would be there in any numbers. But Dr Whitehead found them exactly where Captain Colnett had reported great concentrations 190 years earlier. How Whitehead's aim was to stay with the whales constantly to learn about their social structure and the interaction between females and the large males. Individual whales can be identified by body markings and the shape of their tail flukes. Gradually, the Ellendale's crew built up a dossier that enabled them to recognize over 200 whales. Sperm whales have been known to sink ships, though the crew of the Ellendale found them to be gentle. It's likely that sinkings have been the result of ships colliding with sleeping whales. This huge male made no threatening gestures and eventually submerged. There must be at least 50. Hal Whitehead records, although from the deck the whales appeared like a raft of inanimate locks, Beneath the surface, they were revealed as extraordinarily flexible, tactile and tender animals. We saw them gently stroke one another with their small flippers, or nuzzle a smooth, bulbous brow against a vast, wrinkled flank. So little is known about sperm whales that everything that can be learned, even at this late stage, may contribute to bringing them back from the brink to which centuries of commercial overkill have brought them. When a whale dived, leaving the calm patch known as a footprint on the surface, echo sounding apparatus followed its progress. There is no echo sounder, however, that can follow a whale five kilometers deep.
also directional hydrophones we use to stay in touch. It's at 1,500 feet. When feeding below the surface, each whale transmits a highly personalized series of clicks at about the rate of one a second. These clicks are thought to be a means of locating the giant squid on which the sperm whales feed. Hal Whitehead found that they could detect the bearing of a clicking whale at a range of eight kilometers and then set course and speed to intercept it when it surfaced. A year or two before, Dr. Whitehead had sailed the Ellendil to the Indian Ocean to study sperm whales off Sri Lanka. The monsoons made the seas too rough for precise observation during six months of the year. The clarity and comparative calm of Galapagos waters now proved ideal. An 11-metre sloop is a small living area for five people. The research voyage entailed nearly 2,000 hours of night and day whale following and watching. Five minutes in every hour were spent recording whale clicks. Domestic chores, including bread making, were shared by whoever was off watch at the time. Can you repeat that, please? At least 50. Out at sea, improvisation is necessary. The dough is set to rise in the heat of the diesel engine. So what was achieved by the crews of the Ellendil on the Galapagos sperm whale grounds? To begin with, a number of whales were identified through photography so that their individual behavior and relationships in the group could be studied. Their dive cycles were firmly established, confirming the old-time whaler's rule that for every third of a metre of its length, a sperm whale breathes once at the surface and spends one minute submerged. Thus, a 15-metre whale blows about 50 times and then goes down for up to 50 minutes. On surfacing, the whales sometimes breach, leaping clear of the water. It's thought that they do this to let their companions know where they are.
perhaps the major conclusion that Hal Whitehead reached was that sperm whales are highly sociable animals. The whales quite obviously like to get together at least once a day, cruising at two to three knots on a parallel course in a phalanx several kilometers wide. 200 females and calves were identified, moving in 13 stable groups. It was already known that the females spend most of their time in the tropics, while the males depart for much of the year to far northern or southern waters. They return to the female herds to mate. Off the Galapagos, Hal Whitehead had a chance to study the interaction of males with females. Surprisingly, he found no aggression or territorial behavior among possible rival males. Dr. Whitehead and his researchers found only seven mature bulls in the seas around Rocca Redonda. A large bull is at the center of this female group. The average time that any of these bulls spend with a party of females was about six hours. From this, the team deduced that bulls conduct their sex lives as a series of brief encounters, rather than staying with and controlling a large group of females. The fact that the team found only a small number of bulls may be due to overhunting in the past. It was the big bulls that were the whaler's prime target. Hunting is believed to be the reason that the whales don't breed every year. It must be emphasized that the cruise of the Ellendil though it broke much new ground, was really only a reconnaissance of a very promising new study area. Scientific study of the species will be of no avail unless the complete ban on the hunting of sperm whales can be adhered to for at least the next 50 years. An international moratorium does exist on whale hunting, and officially there is no commercial sperm whale hunt. Unofficially, Sperm whales are still hugely profitable and too much of an incentive to unscrupulous hunters. And the sperm whale must face additional threats. Pollution, changes in climate, oceanic noise and nets from commercial fishermen. It will need more than great intelligence to overcome such daunting adversities to its own survival. <laughs>